Welcome everyone. We're just going to get, I'm going to wait another minute to let some other people join and then we'll get started uh, with the presentation this morning. Hi folks, I think there's still some people joining, but I, I'm going to start so that we, we stick on time. So uh, welcome to the 2019-2020 Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation webinar series. I hope everyone can see and hear okay. If not, you can uh, use the chat button and let me know if you have any difficulties. We will be recording this, um, so it will be available on the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation website after the presentation. My name is Michelle Gray. I'm uh, a professor in forestry and environmental management at the University of New Brunswick. Um, Darla Saunders, who is the, the, the brain power and does all the heavy lifting for this webinar series, um, unfortunately had a, a family emergency, so she's unable to join us this morning. So I'm filling in for her. Um, so I hope I can do the same job that, that Darla does. But um, again, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar and this series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions by the Government of Canada. And for today's webinar, kicking off the new season, we are very pleased to be hosting Dr. Pascal Biron. She's from the, she's a professor and chair of Geography, Planning and Environment at Concordia University, where she studied at the Université de Moncton and Leeds University. Um, in fluvial geomorphology. She studies, uh, she's a busy woman. She studies river dynamics, stream restoration of fish habitats, sustainable management of agricultural streams, climate change impacts on rivers, and three-dimensional computational fluid dynamics and river management. Um, after the presentation, we'll open the floor for questions and answers, and you'll have the option of asking questions directly using your microphone on your computer or your, or your uh, telephone if you're joining in that way or you can type them in the chat, or sorry, the question box on your webinar control panel, and I'll read them out loud uh, for, for you. Um, but now I will turn the webinar over to Dr. Biron. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'll just uh, make a point of precision that I've studied at Université de Montréal, in fact, not the University of Moncton, just as a clarification. Um, so uh, today I was actually asked uh, to present in English a webinar that I have presented uh, last year in the fall uh, in French um, and the uh, initial request to present this uh, in French was, and now I'm trying to see how to change slide on my computer, hang on, um, how am I doing this, sorry I have a technical, da -da -da. so changing slides should be simple. Uh, and it seems to be frozen. Hang on. Um, Michelle, will, you won't have any suggestion for me to see? Uh, normally it should just be the uh, regular. Uh, okay, I've unfrozen it, fine. Okay, good. So the uh, original request to present this webinar in French last year came actually from a, a literature review that I presented uh, in 2017 to the Fondation de la Fonde du Québec. 
precisely on this question. Uh, so that document is available, but obviously it's uh, only available in French. Uh, and because of the context, then uh, a lot of the material uh, was actually based on the Quebec situation, but uh, certainly applies to uh, other provinces. Um, so related to that, uh, there are other papers uh, recently published, one of them in English and the Canadian geographer, uh, if you're interested. Of course, it's much shorter than the uh, actual document of the Lit Review. Uh, and another one more in the lay language, again in French, in the uh, journal Vector Environnement. So uh, the situation of fish habitat in Quebec, which uh, is presumably also similar in other provinces, uh, is that 82% uh, of the project actually that we're, we've looked at that were led by watershed organizations called in, in Quebec OBV for, for Organisme de Bassin Versant. So since 2010 uh, until the lit review was written in 2017, we're really about brook trout in French, Omble de Fontaine. Uh, these projects included what's called stream cleaning, uh, removal of wooded debris and beaver dams, uh, construction of weirs or deflectors, gravel addition and bank stabilization. This is one example from the OBV Saguenay, uh, building a, a weir in this case. And I don't know why this slide changing is really complicated. I will try again. Okay, so uh, this is a table actually coming from the document of the lit review. I will not go through this, but just to illustrate, uh, if you see Omble de Fontaine, it's really the dominating uh, species. And a lot of the time uh, cleaning, removing wood particularly is very, very common in all these projects. So I'll, I'll just go quickly through these slides that are part of that lit review. Uh, document. So the plan today, uh, there are three parts to my presentation. The first is really to look at uh, 101 course of 101 course on the hydrogeomorphology, fluvial processes and habitats, then move on to uh, the importance of process based restoration and th that change of perspective that occurred in the last decades, uh, but focusing on in stream structures, artificial spawning sites, woody debris, and beaver dams, boon or bane, uh, and looking at uh, how things are done and also what's, what the science says about that. And lastly, looking at a few examples of regional guidelines and river management concepts that promote and apply process-based uh, restoration. So in terms of fluvial processes and habitat, the first part, uh, we're talking about the watershed, which everyone you know, is familiar with, I guess, but we often see watershed more in terms of the liquid discharge water uh, and sometimes forgetting that it's also uh, transferring the solid discharge sediments uh, with the zones of production and the headlands, zones of transfer of sediments in the middle parts and the zones of storage downstream. And that uh, implies uh, that there are storage um, zones because unlike water, sediments do not move all the time. They can be stored for a few years, few decades, and even longer periods of time. Uh, naturally, they can be stored in bars that we see uh, easily, an example here in, a, in the meandering river, or uh, artificially behind dams, which uh, prevent sediment transit downstream. A few uh, ways as well to characterize rivers, two broad categories, alluvial or non-alluvial rivers. Um, and it's important to know about this before doing any interventions in rivers. So typically head streams are uh, more non-alluvial. Um, so the morphology there does not adjust easily when there are perturbation, whereas uh, further downstream, there are more alluvial streams that can respond to perturbations of either the liquid or the solid discharge um, more easily. There are also, it's important to know before doing any type of interventions in a river, uh, what's the fluvial style, the type of rivers. Um, there are four broad types. Uh, th those are examples actually coming from a French document from France, but they are applicable anywhere. So straight with steep slope uh, that we see obviously more in mountainous areas, alternate bars. For meanders, either developed or migrating meanders and then braided and anastomosed. And then it's important as well to understand that there is a very strong link between the liquid and the solid discharge. Uh, there's a very classic diagram here called the Lane's balance. 
uh, that depicts this. Um, so on the left, sediment supply, so the solid discharge is on the right, the liquid discharge. Um, and the a lot of the times there are human interventions that perturb that equilibrium. Uh, for example, if you decrease the sediment load by constructing a dam, say, or putting weirs that trap sediments are massively protecting banks because banks are a natural source of sediments for rivers. Then you decrease the sediment discharge, the, the solid discharge on the left, and that results in a disequilibrium towards degradation, which means a vertical incision or bed erosion. So the, the science that I represent, which is hydrogeomorphology, uh, is also very connected to uh, a concept that we've developed in Quebec uh, called Freedom Space for Rivers in English and French, uh, Espace de Liberté, where we take into account the key fluvial processes. Firstly, that meanders migrate laterally. Uh, they th therefore occupy more space than the actual channel that we see. And it's easy to see that when we do not intervene, and you can see the former path of the river. And it's relatively simple to explain as well, uh, because there's uh, what's called a spiral flow or helical flow uh, that erodes the sediments on the outside bank and brings these sediments on the inside bank. So uh, that meander in the example would move towards uh, the right. And the other uh, very important fluvial process is that rivers overflow their banks regularly. Uh, we bank, what's called bankful stages reach every one and a half to two years on average. Uh, above that, obviously, you know, it flows in, in what's called the floodplain. So the hydrogeomorphic approach uh, to managing rivers is that bank erosion, floods are natural processes. So for example, not all banks that undergo erosion are problematic and need to be controlled. And in fact, uh, increasingly uh, in the literature, we see that bank erosion is seen as desirable in terms of habitat. This is a sort of classic paper uh, from over 10 years ago in bioscience showing this. Uh, so in general, bank erosion floods are only a problem where you have urban or agricultural development that constrains the space allocated to rivers. And related to that, there's a very classic paper cited over 400 times by Beachy and collaborators insisting on the need to move towards process-based principles for restoring river ecosystems. Uh, so that really has been, that's 2010. So it, we're really in a period of change and paradigm here, looking as well at, at the riparian areas, the floodplain uh, in a broad perspective, uh, including a three-dimensional perspective. Um, floodplain development depends on its connectivity with the channel. Some of the consequences of, uh, for example, channel incision and the resulting disconnection from the floodplain are the lowering of the water table, higher water temperature, morphological simplification. So you really need a broad holistic perspective on these areas to understand the problems and, and solve them. So back to hydrogeomorphology uh, and that link with freedom space, the way we've defined freedom space or espace de liberté uh, in Quebec is actually the sum of two spaces, the mobility space, the fact that meanders migrate laterally, occupy more space than the channel, and that flood space, the fact that in most cases the river in, is in its channel, what's called in French the limineur, sometimes will you know, flood towards what's called in French the moyen, and more exceptionally, the majeur occupying obviously way more space. Um, and to that, we've added the riparian wetlands as part of the freedom space, because we believe uh, it's really part of an integrity space. So this was a project that took place in 2011 to 2013 in Quebec um, with my colleagues, uh, Thomas buffin bélanger from uh, Université du Québec à Rimouski and Marie Larocque from Université du Québec à Montréal. Uh, and at the time we've mapped, we were focusing on three rivers in Quebec, Yamaska Sudest, De La Roche, and Matan. And one of the original part of the, the approach is to not just map a corridor, but to really have two main levels of freedom space, the minimum level in blue here, uh, and the longer term functional space uh, in brownish. And there's a third level for rare extreme events, um, but mainly two levels. And you can see that you know, it's the river dynamics that dictates that space. So it's not like a fixed riparian zone here. It's highly variable. 
So that was the original project. Since then, uh, many other rivers were mapped uh, for freedom space. I'm listing a few here in Quebec, Mastidouche, Poitikouk, du Nord, Métis, Nejet. Uh, the way we're representing this uh, may have changed slightly, but it's always the same concept, two main levels, minimum freedom space and a uh, functional one. So there's a link with all that I'm presenting in this first part and habitat quality, because lateral migration uh, provides you know, uh, habitat that are of high quality for aquatic species, uh, even for, in this case, uh, birds. Uh, so it, it, it's well known that, in fact, in terms of the diversity of habitat in the floodplain, the best situation is one where you have actively meandering rivers. On the one hand, when you're fossilizing rivers, stabilizing them really heavily, uh, you are really decreasing sig significantly the possibility for habitat diversity. And on the other extreme, when you have very, very active river uh, migration, like braided rivers, then it's too fast. So that the optimal situation is, is the meandering rivers that is free to uh, erode its banks. And that's looking at things. You can look at things from the plan form perspective, but also uh, the looking at this from the cross-sectional perspective, when you do have meandering rivers, you have that diversity in cross-sections that is really uh, best for fish and other aquatic species. Whereas when you are fossilizing these rivers, uh, typically in trapezoidal shapes, that is really the, the worst situation in terms of habitat. There's also a link between the meandering dynamics and uh, aquatic habitats through riparian wetlands. Uh, the natural processes of meanders is that at some point there'll be a cutoff creating oxbow lakes. An example here is in France, the Ain River close to uh, Lyon. In 2000, you can see a sort of a sharp meander that in 2005 was cut off, so somewhere between the two dates. Uh, and eventually continues to progress since 2009. And this is a, a photograph uh, taken in 2013 showing a riparian wetland. This is a great uh, habitat, a lot of diversity there. So it is important to have these processes um, occurring to create these riparian wetlands. However, uh, there are a lot of human interventions that prevent that mobility. This is one example here in the Yamaska Sudest River in Quebec, where you have the aerial photo of 1950 in uh, black and uh, the 2009 channel layout, and in red, the bank stabilization. If we focus on one meander here upstream, even in 1950, it was obvious that there was some water cutting off during high flow, very obvious in 1979, uh, but that was completely filled and stabilized. So in, effectively, we, we have prevented the creation of a riparian wetland here. Uh, similarly, at the downstream end, uh, we had there were, for agricultural purposes, at that land you know, became agricultural land uh, through human interventions. Another important aspect of meander dynamics is the presence of woody debris. Uh, obviously, if the river migrates, uh, and there are trees uh, near on the banks, then these trees will end up in the river at some point. Uh, we were able, with a former master student who's currently a research professional uh, in my lab, to quantify this. Uh, this is for the Yamaska Sudest again, looking at mobility uh, and three types of habitat bars, oxbows, and wooded debris, and showing that where you have high mobility, you do have the presence of these habitats, not sometimes the three of them, sometimes only some of them together, but there's definitely a link between mobility and habitat that we were able to quantify with the mobility index and a, a habitat index. So wood is important, I'll come back to it. Uh, so mobility brings trees in the channel, providing excellent habitat. Uh, this is an example, the photograph here from uh, in the UK, adding large woody debris, LWD. Uh, in, I'm not sure of my translation here, but in Quebec there is a, um, a law uh, in French called the Loi sur les compétences municipales, that I've translated the municipal powers, 
which basically forces municipalities to remove any obstruction that threatens the safety of people or property, and that includes trees. Uh, so related to that, there's a lot of stream cleaning and oftentimes restoration is promoted uh, in Quebec, uh, probably related to that law. And also I'll talk about it, some misperceptions in some cases, but when you compare with what's happening elsewhere, uh, a lot of the restoration elsewhere is done by adding trees, large with debris. So there's really some uh, clarifications on the science side that are needed here. So that brings me to the second part of uh, my presentation on the importance of process-based restoration, a change in perspective, but looking at uh, firstly in-stream structures that have been put in rivers uh, for many decades now. Uh, in the United States alone, about 30,000 structures between 1933 and 1935. So uh, it's been particularly used in North America up until the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, there are some positive res results that were documented for salmonids. This is actually work coming from uh, my former master's student uh, with a meta-analysis. Uh, and you can see that for different species, different size class, uh, there were a positive effect. Uh, but there are very few long-term studies uh, when you're looking at uh, studies that follow up the restoration projects and it's known as well um, that artificial structures weirs deflectors have a higher failure rate than more natural structures using woody debris say. so the restoration of specific habitats now replaced is now replaced um, by watershed restoration thus focusing on many species instead of only on salmonids, which definitely uh, dominates uh, out there in terms of restoration projects. So the in-stream structure approach is, has been increasingly abandoned since the 1990s, although we'll see not everywhere the same way. Uh, if we go to the recommendations of fisheries and oceans, um, this is a report from 2012 um, written in French, so presumably more affecting uh, what's happening in Quebec than in other provinces, but this is a figure taken from that report and you can see that clearly structures like weirs here are, are promoted. Uh, and this document, as I say, has a lot of importance because it's used by a lot of watershed organization. Uh, a, re a more recent uh, document providing guidelines for uh, river restoration. This is coming from uh, river managers called the uh, the gestionnaire régionaux de cours d'eau in Quebec. So they take, they have taken their figures from the fisheries and oceans document. Um, and when we look at the science on weir installation, uh, it is not recommended. Uh, certainly in the recent literature, uh, these are just a few examples of papers. One of them from uh, Margaret Palmer and collaborators cited more than 500 times. So, you know, unintended consequences, uh, so there are a lot of examples of uh, failure related to these structures. So what does the science say? Well, these weirs are useful structures to counter headward erosion problems. Uh, that's usually related to sediment extraction, uh, particularly in gravel bed rivers. These sediments were often used for construction purposes. Uh, that results in, in bed incision. So it, it's typically related to uh, human and modifications um, that create, this is a figure in French that may not be obvious for everyone to understand, but basically this creates a nick point that migrates upward and these weirs are solutions to prevent the nick point from further migrating upward. So that is a case where weir installation is, is promoted. For improvements in fish habitat uh, using weir installation in rivers that are not affected by headward erosion, uh, that remains to be demonstrated whether this is a really valid approach. And when you look at recommendations elsewhere, for example, here the Washington State Guidelines, 2012 as well, so the same year as the, the Fisheries and Oceans Guidelines. Uh, first of all, that's the table of content of that guideline. Um, you can see that there's a whole chapter on stream processes and habitat. When you search for a word that starts with geomorph something and you get over 280 results, 
whereas the uh, Fishers and Oceans document does not at all include these concepts. Uh, so this guide is very, very focused on fluvial processes and indicates that in-stream structures should be limited to cases where first the natural processes that create and maintain habitat have been severely constrained or eliminated and cannot be effectively restored. Secondly, opportunity exists to provide short-term benefits during the years, decades, or longer timeframes necessary for certain processes to fully recover. And third, recovery plans for listed species identify specific habitats as critical and urgent for near-term recovery objectives. So now moving to artificial spawning sites. First point here is that it is absolutely essential to take into consideration the cause of the observed degradation before planning an intervention such as gravel addition. Particle size in the river will normally vary in a watershed. Uh, it's strongly linked to channel slope, uh, also linked to sediment availability, availability from hill slopes or alluvial plain. So it's normal that Coarser particles will be present in the small headwater streams where you have steeper slopes and that particle size decreases downstream. So there's a high risk of failure for projects that involves addition of coarse particles in rivers. This is an example here of a, a restoration project for Lake Sturgeon in the Wahoo River in Quebec. Uh, if the stream energy in the area is low, then the fine particles will deposit likely bury the gravel. On the opposite, if you have a more dynamic stream, then you have risks of transporting the artificially added substrate downstream. So it's a restoration technique that is generally, generally limited to streams that are highly disturbed by human interventions, particularly dams. There are positive results that were noted in the literature, but often they are temporary. They also require frequent maintenance, these projects. An example from a study by Barlop and collaborators in 2008, three of seven restored spawning sites by gravel addition had become unusable by the salmon after five years of monitoring. So frequent additions of gravel would have been required to maintain them. This is also often used in combination with other methods like adding boulders or deflectors or weirs. And it's been noted in some studies that there's little impact on diversity or abundance uh, related to adding gravel. Now back to woody debris that I've mentioned already a few times, um, those woody debris that occupy the entire width of the channel, they promote gravel accumulation zones, which are subsequently used by salmonids to spawn. So many projects that aim to improve brook trout habitat, particularly in Quebec, they combine techniques of gravel addition with removal of woody debris. And that seems counterproductive because woody debris promote gravel accumulation. So it is recommended to only use in-stream structures and gravel addition as a short-term measure, measure until processes in the watershed are restored. Now, these woody debris, uh, here I'll focus on them. Um, first, they're and a natural result of interactions between the fluvial processes I was previously describing and the successional processes of near channel vegetation is a very important component of woodland ecosystems. But there's really a negative public perception of wood debris causing supposedly erosion and flooding. And as a result, wood debris removal was once one of the most common forms of stream alteration. Back to uh, the Fisheries and Oceans uh, recommendation, the guidelines, this is in French, uh, that's my translation here. Uh, stream cleaning to improve brook trout habitat is a widespread activity in Quebec. It consists primarily of removing some of the riparian vegetation, wood debris, log jams, or ancient beaver dams that contribute to a decrease in the overall habitat quality of the brook trout. There are many things that I could say about this statement first that there's no reference here. Um, so it, it really associates wood debris uh, to a decrease in the habitat quality. Um, and as I'll show in a few minutes, this is really not what the science says. So it's a bit puzzling to see such a statement 
without supporting uh, evidence of uh, reference. In fact, in this document, there are no, no references. Uh, in, I was mentioning that such guidelines are important, certainly in Quebec, because uh, the main, uh, the funding of restoration projects uh, often comes from what's called in Quebec Fondation de la Faune. This is a document from 2015. I haven't checked recently if there are changes, but uh, at that time, the project funding is, was allocated based on expected results. That's the number of meters of stream clean, number of beaver dams or log jams dismantled, number of weirs, deflectors, bank cover and spawning areas developed. So directly connected to, to the fisheries and oceans guidelines. Time, in terms of the science, this is a document from uh, California. Uh, large wooded debris are known to trap not only sediments, but also organic matter. And that's food for aquatic species and a significant uh, component of that. And anyone who's seen in rivers uh, would uh, often have noted that that's where the fish will be. Uh, my colleagues from UBC, a uh, paper a few years ago, uh, were talking about the ignorance of the benefits of trees and streams. Uh, this is a quote from their paper, by increasing channel roughness, wood decreases the amount of energy available to transport sediment and to erode the bed and banks. In the UK, uh, another quote here from a 2010 document, the presence of wooded debris is increasingly being viewed as a cheap form of natural river rehabilitation and flood defense. Defense. So it's often perceived as causing flood, but here uh, it helps solve flood problems. And I insist it is a perfectly natural process, the recruitment of woody debris, because it's normal for rivers to uh, erode their banks. Uh, if we go back to 1996, the US National Academy of Sciences, uh, that's their quote, perhaps no other structural component of the environment is as important to salmon habitat as is large woody debris. So it's been a while that we have known the importance of wood. Back to the California document, another quote, a lot of wood is removed from streams in error, however, because of misperceptions of the role of large wooded debris in streams. Many people still see wood as a potential barrier to fish migration, so they pull wood out to, quote unquote, help the fish. So a lot of literature on that. This is a recent paper by Philip Roney, who's done a lot of work on restoration, showing uh, the evolution from uh, structures used prior to the 1990s with wood, very uh, fixed structures moving towards, on the right, more modern techniques with more mobile natural wood uh, with little or no anchoring. So in, the, in light of the scientific paradigm shift in the field of stream restoration in the recent years, it appears important to no longer promote stream cleaning as a means of improving the habitat of brook trout or other fish species. Uh, an example from Roney's work, 77 of 88 studies that evaluated wood debris effectiveness showed improvement in at least one habitat component. Uh, tons of examples of wood debris placement across the world. This is NOAA Fisheries on the top. Uh, an example from France at the bottom, uh, adding you know, diversification in rivers through wood. So it's, it's widely known. So the question should therefore not be whether or not wood debris should be used in restoration, but rather what structural conditions, the size, flow, orientation, etc., are appropriate in a given location. Uh, another recent example from 2018, the reintroduction of wood. I won't read the, the abstract, but you know, a lot of arguments there in favor of uh, at least letting wood there, but uh, adding wood as well. Now, related to wood, uh, but specific to you know, beaver, beaver dams, uh, Boone or Bain, uh, there are significant changes in the conditions of stream hydrology uh, morphology, water quality, which can directly influence habitat, fish and other biota related to beaver dams. That's well known. Beaver dams, we have to remember though, are natural dynamic components of many fluvial systems. 
Uh, the strength of impact is highly site-specific with beaver dams, direct effects tending to be the strongest for smaller streams, many positive impacts such as increased heterogeneity, species and habitat diversity are evident at the landscape scale. So the presence of beaver dams generally alters the flow conditions of stream networks by decreasing the volume of low tick sections in favor of increasing the volume of lentic sections in the reach. They contribute to increasing floodplain area and connectivity. It's been also documented in the literature that there are impacts on water quality, nitrogen, phosphorus, dissolved oxygen, but these are fairly localized with no significant effect in the long term. There's also documentation about the impact on siltation of spawning habitat, but water exiting the dam will have reduced sediment loads, which could actually benefit some species, for example, trout. Impact on temperature, an increase in temperature were also noted, but the changes appear to be fairly localized, depending on the degree of vegetation shading as well as groundwater contributions. Since beaver dams promote the creation of pool rather than riffle habitat, the species composition of a reach may be altered in favor of lentic species rather than lotic ones. It's been also documented. But other studies have noted that rivers tended to be biologically more diverse when beavers were present. So there's no clear consensus in the literature on their impact on biodiversity. But there's a very interesting meta-analysis of Kemp and collaborators in 2012 that I'll present here. Uh, it's a particularly good meta-analysis, in my opinion, uh, because not only does it uh, do, a, of course, a thorough review of the literature, uh, splitting this in positive or negative impacts, but it also has assessed how much of the, the statements, the findings about the impact of beaver dams is based on data versus speculative? And one thing you see here on the positive side is enhanced diversity, species richness, uh, based on data uh, in over 87% of the time. Brook, brown trout, brook char, co-hosts, okay, Simon, were all found to be significantly larger in beaver ponds compared to non-impounded areas of the stream. Several uh, papers on that. Non-salmonid fish species have also been shown to benefit from beaver dams, particularly during times of low flow where the pounds increase the water volume, providing more foraging space, a refuge for fry. Uh, many species, on, many, many papers on that. Uh, there are even, uh, this is a Washington uh, guidelines again, uh, promotion for beaver reintroduction, so beaver dam analog here. Now on the negative impact side, again from the Kemp uh, uh, meta-analysis, the barriers to fish movement definitely appears in many, many uh, papers. But it's interesting to see that over 78% of those are speculative. And it's worse for uh, altered temperature regime, more than 90% speculative. So the negative perception of beaver dams as being barriers to fish movement or raising water temperatures too much for salmonid species survive are largely speculative. And these are again from different papers, not, it's not me here saying this, uh, that uh, the negative impacts uh, are reported mainly from studies with weak experimental designs Again, from Kemp, uh, meta-analysis, largely speculative, but they do influence management decisions. And in some areas, beaver dams are actually removed as restoration measures, for example, northern Wisconsin. Back to the fisheries and oceans uh, recommendation, again, my translation, uh, the dismantling of beaver dams or of largewood jams must be carried out in a gradual manner to avoid an excessive evacuation of the water stored upstream. So this is not saying per se that it, it is a recommended uh, method, but it sort of is implicit. And there are examples of quote unquote restoration projects following these recommendations. So dismantling the beaver dam here again in, in the Saguenay. Uh, watershed organization document. So what does the science say on beaver dams? Uh, the many, many papers 
maintaining fish biodiversity, uh, looking specifically or at beaver dams, are, do they impede the movement of trout? So there's a lot of literature. These are some quotes. Fish biodiversity increased in the presence of beaver dams. Retaining beaver dams can help maintain fluvial habitat and aquatic biodiversity in low gradient systems. Our results refute the largely speculative concerns about beaver dams acting as migration bar barriers. The beaver dam actually population in North America prior to the Europeans arrival was estimated between 60 to 400 million. So the, just logically, since beavers and salmonids have historically coexisted without human intervention, the presence of these dams represents a natural component of the ecosystem that does not need to be eliminated. So last part of my presentation is giving you a few examples of regional guidelines, river management concepts that promote and apply concepts of process-based restoration, starting with Europe, where the Water Framework Directive established in 2000 uh, promotes restoration measures that are based on hydrogeomorphological concepts to restore fluvial processes. These are a couple of documents from France on so French, uh, but there are many others, uh, many in English. In France, in fact, the term espace de liberté, which we borrowed from them, uh, so that that's where it came from. Uh, but in France, it was considered really more as a mobility space. Uh, this was uh, developed in the Rhône-Alpes area, which, where rivers are very dynamic. They moved from that concept to some broader concept called in French, uh, espace de bon fonctionnement, which is a bit difficult to translate. Um, but uh, so th there's been a, you know, a, a lot of work in the last decades in France to get to this uh, broader perspective where, and it's illustrated here, the science of hydrogeomorphology is called in French, in France, hydromorphology, but it's the same as what we call hydrogeomorphology in Quebec, um, is at the heart of this. And I know this is an ugly figure, but it just shows, I've translated this as space of good functioning. I'm not sure of the proper way to translate this. Uh, you see that the good morphological function in, is at the heart of the approach. It is in center, so the hydrogeomorphological part, and that connects to good hydrogeological functioning, so groundwater, hydraulics, so flood management, say, ecological, uh, and biogeochemical, so the water quality as well. So there are many, many links between ecology and hydrogeomorphology at various scales, from the watershed scale down to the very micro scale. And that's, again, the French uh, document there. Uh, this is yet another example coming from France. This is the Agence Française pour la Biodiversité. I'm just putting this to show you yeah, restoring hydromorphology or geomorphology of streams is really, really seen as the key for healthy habitat uh, in Europe. An example of a restoration project, uh, we're talking about millions of euros invested here in the Les River. This is in the, uh, again, the Lyon area. Uh, you can see giving more space to river on that uh, the less um, is at the heart of the approach. Another example on the Iseron River, this is a tributary of the Rhone near Lyon. You can see that there are issues with floods. The houses are very close to that stream. That's quite dangerous. But at the same time, they're promoting habitat by adding vegetation in the channel. This is underway here further downstream. The work was completed. Fish are already back and it's, it's a success. Closer to us in BC, um, this is a document from 2010 uh, that uh, look at watershed restoration. Uh, some examples taken from that document of uh, the restoration of fluvial processes, the vegetation reestablishment to promote natural succession processes of gravel bars, revegetation of denuded soaps and escarpments using bioengineering techniques, uh, bioengineering again measures and scoured gullies to create channel roughness, trap sediment, promote revegetation, and examples of short and long-term rehabilitation measures, again from the BC document, uh, preventing further disturbance such as remediating unstable or eroding roads, 
re-establishing structures to mimic natural conditions that were lost through disturbance and that's promoting placement of large wood debris in streams uh, where recruitment of natural wood has been reduced or delayed by loss of sources enhancing or creating habitat such as constructing habitat and flooded gravel pits connected to streams to offset habitat loss and creating conditions that will allow natural processes to approach targeted levels of function such as riparian treatments promoting the growth of a natural mix of species in the riparian forests. So this is all you know, promoted in BC. Uh, so where an example of a good situation with wood on the left, whereas a bad situation where woody debris has been removed, uh, which is really not optimal for fish habitat. The uh, Washington state, uh, I have spoken about already a few times today. Uh, it's a very interesting document, in fact. Um, first of all, uh, stating that all, you should always carry out a complete analysis of the situation before determining the most appropriate method of restoration. Uh, that's the first step. And what's interesting is that to specify that decisions must be made according to four levels of priorities and only if the first three levels cannot be achieved should an approach be adopted based on the addition of structures such as we are uh, or deflectors so priority number four and i'll just go through these four levels because i think they're quite interesting first and above all protect habitat so protect areas with healthy, high quality habitats to prevent further degradation. Then connect habitat. Connect, provide access to isolated habitat, including in-stream, off-channel and estuarine habitat made inaccessible by, say, culverts, levees or other human-made obstructions. Restore habitat forming processes. So employed land use recovery, watershed restoration techniques to restore processes that create, maintain, and connect habitats, including restoration of sediment dynamics, large wood dynamics, flow regime, adequately sized, healthy riparian zones, floodplain connectivity, water quality, channel evolutionary processes, and employ a combination of passive and active restoration techniques as necessary. So passive would be leaving more space and letting the processes come back uh, naturally over the years. And then the last, so after these three first levels, uh, the fourth one, create or enhance habitat, modify or create stream habitat by such measures as installing in-stream structures, reconfiguring channel platform, cross-section profile, or constructed, constructing a new side channel. But that's really if you cannot do the other steps and if there's a, a real danger of losing some species. So in conclusion, leaving hopefully some time for, for questions and discussion, um, there is a very strong consensus in the scientific literature on avoiding as much as possible direct interventions in streams such as the construction of weirs, deflectors, spawning gravel, to work on the river corridor as a whole so that bank erosion and flood processes can operate. The scientific evidence that the presence of wood is beneficial to fish and the lack of evidence to date that the costs of channel reconfiguration and addition of in-stream structures are offset by biological recovery. That's Margaret Palmer again uh, with her team. And certainly for the Quebec, I'm, I don't know enough about the other provinces, but it really is important to thoroughly review the current recommendations uh, in fish habitat restoration in rivers. So thank you. That's the end of my presentation. And I'll be happy to have, answer questions if any. Thank you very much, Dr. Beran. So now we will open the session for question and answers. If you want to ask a question, you can use your webinar control panel, the little gray box. If your box is minimized, you can hit the orange arrow to enlarge it. If you're using the audio on your computer, you can raise your virtual hand, um, a ye little yellow hand icon with a green arrow, and I can unmute you to ask a question. Or you can type your question in the control panel uh, question box, and I will, read aloud, I will read it aloud for you during the session. And um, you can also ask your questions in French as well. 
So I'll just start with the question boxes. So right now, um, someone asked if a copy of the presentation would be available after the webinar. So the recording of this presentation will be posted on the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation website in a few days. Um, but there's also a question if we can have a copy of your references to be able to post. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. And these references are in the document, the French uh, Lit Review, uh, that is also accessible. So yes, definitely. Okay, we can get that posted too. Great. Um, uh, next, oh, this is more, not a question, but a comment, but it says a very interesting presentation, seeing how government recommendations don't match the science. Merci. Um, and then here we go, another one from, so that was from uh, Emily Zimmerman from Jerry Leering. Scientists lost a lot of credibility with the public back in the 1980s when using the term global warming. The more accepted term is now climate change. Restoration is another misnomer that has little recognition to the current variability that has increased to extremes not seen before, with more extremes being forecasted. To better establish credibility, the term restoration should be strongly discouraged. Please consider a more appropriate term, uh, remediation. No, I absolutely agree. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a term, however, that's yeah. heavily used. So I'm. this is really a presentation reporting on what's uh, in the literature, but uh, yeah, I agree that uh, uh, it would be more appropriate to use remediation in several cases, um, but it's still widely used out there, the word restoration, so. Absolutely. Uh, Will Daniels um, says, would you have any suggestions on how to address the issue of liability when using unanchored, unanchored large woody debris in streams when it comes to infrastructure, for example, culverts, bridges, private land, et cetera? Yeah, that is, uh, I mean, that is a very good qu question, in fact. Uh, and the cases where you have public safety issues with regards to the roads, bridge, or whatever, uh, is where you have to be quite cautious and, and certainly uh, do studies. There's a lot of uh, vast literature on uh, wood, particularly from Europe and countries like Switzerland, uh, where they can have massive amounts of woods affecting bridge. Uh, stability. I think it's important to just distinguish the public safety issue from the fish habitat. Uh, I'll use again the word restoration, even if it's an incorrect use of it. Um, so for, so for certain public safety issues, uh, it may not be possible to let wood you know, uh, be unanchored. Uh, yeah. But it's it's just the, the, what's the objective here? And I, my presentation today was mainly focusing on uh, restoring uh, the fish habitat, but when there are public safety issues, then certainly a study is important to verify that there's no risk for uh, bridges or other infrastructure. Excellent. Um, Fabian asks, uh, says, thank you for the presentation. Heterogeneity seems to be an important aspect for fish habitat. Is time and durability equally important? For example, renewal of gravel and spatial habitat can be considered a high quality component. That's the question. I'm trying to understand. I mean, meaning that in the long term, we need to make sure that, for example, there are sources of sediments that mm. are still not disconnected, I suppose. That's the question. I'm trying to, I'm not sure that that is exactly what is meant, but it, but it is certainly true. And the same for wood, that you need to make sure that the, the recruitment is possible in the long term. It's not just adding wood that uh, if you, the forests around streams uh, can naturally provide the wood. Same for uh, gravel sediments, if there are disconnections in the watershed um, between the hill slopes, say, and the river system, then working on more long-term restoration of these connections should be part of it. But I'm not sure that I'm answering the question properly here. Okay. Uh, Jerry has another comment regarding uh, nomenclature. Uh, woody debris is another misnomer and should be best touted as being structure that has many positive benefits and complexing um, stream habitats. It's not garbage. You, using the correct term will create a better understanding of its value and reduce misconceptions. Absolutely, and typically large wood is the term. Uh, I, I have kept woody debris here because there are so many studies and this is being a, a mm -hmm. report on the literature review. Uh, so LWD for large wood debris is a very, yeah. very common way of referring to it, but I absolutely agree that the word debris is problematic 
because there's a lot of misperceptions. So uh, a lot of the more recent research uh, uses the term large wood and drops the word debris. Uh, yeah. Interesting, yeah. Uh, Chelsea Renault says, can the type of woody debris that is used also impact the effect that it has on the stream? The type in the sense, I suppose, the, the size or the orientation, I guess that's I'm the, not, I'm, I'm not assuming sure. that's the question. There, there is definitely, and that was one of the, the point I was making. I mean, it, it, it's 100% consensus that there is beneficial, then it's really to see, okay, what's the, what's the, the optimal, say, uh, way if you're implementing um, wood debris, uh, it, should they be, you know, that there, well, there's the approach of letting the wood, you know, move and eventually form its own structure. In other cases, it's implemented. So you need to think about what's the proper orientation and the optimal size. But again, there's quite a lot of literature on that uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, Fabian has another question. How could we combine stream restoration for fish and public safety in practice? Well, I mean, public safety, uh, there's a hierarchy here that there are clearly cases where you, you need to make sure that public safety is the first objective. You don't want bridges to collapse or uh, our lives to be threatened. Um, so there, there is a compromise. It is possible that in cases where there are issues with public safety you cannot recreate as uh, an ideal habitat. Um, but I, certainly from what I've seen and in the literature, uh, there's sufficient areas that are not directly uh, affecting public safety uh, to provide enough habitat. But it, it certainly is impossible to discount or not take into account at all uh, public safety issues. And that's why you need to thoroughly assess uh, the, the situation before uh, doing any types of intervention. But I, I certainly have seen cases where it was not for public safety reasons that uh, approaches that typically would be normally oriented towards public safety, like removing wood, uh, was, was done. So, it, But I, I, I'm not saying at all that we should not take public safety into consideration. It is the, the top priority um, for river managers. Thank you. Yeah, that's a tough question because it's probably quite site specific or situation specific. Mm -hmm. um, next question from Adam Sams. This is, would you have any recommendations for altering natural wooden structures such as beaver dams, which are impeding Atlantic salmon migration routes? This has been a growing issue in New Brunswick. Yeah, I'm, well, it goes back to the uh, various studies on fish migration. Uh, I, I would like to see uh, a study that has really documented that it is preventing fish migration. As I was discussing, uh, a lot of studies on um, the the role of uh, the barrier role has been shown have been shown to be more speculative. There are cases where, at certain levels of water, it may be a barrier, but because rivers uh, vary, the, the mm. typically fish will find a way at some point. Um, yeah. So it would, I would need to know more about a specific case because, as I say, in, in there is that uh, those discrepancies in the literature between some areas that really seem to think it's having a huge impact on fish migration, and others that say no, fish will always find a way. Um, and, and certainly, the meta-analysis of Kemp and collaborators point to uh, more the speculative. Uh, side of these studies, but if there are studies documented that, I, I would be very interested in seeing them. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan Daigle says, uh, what kind of restoration project can be accepted in mountain areas when the only farmland is part of the alluvial plain? Uh, yeah, it's a good question, but uh, I... <laughs> You, you have to, if I go back to the concept of freedom space, um, what we suggest there, even if a the, the space itself may be quite wide and can include certainly farmland, uh, there's still a possibility for, for farmers to, to work in these areas, as long as a, a fairly decent riparian buffer, say we've determined that it's 15 meters is left uh, protected, the rest can still be used, but the, the key thing is to accept that you will stop intervening. Uh, and this has been done in Vermont as well, with through uh, easement 
systems where there's some financial compensation that comes with this. And that's something we've always said, actually with the freedom space concept that this always, always has to come uh, with uh, compensation for uh, riparian owners and accepting that, okay, if you let the river migrate more freely, then yes, it's possible that you'll lose some of your land, but there will be some compensation uh, coming with that. And overall, uh, no, it's, some people will actually may lose land, others may gain land, depending on where the river is migrating. Um, but it, it's it's a, it's feasible. It's been done elsewhere to have financial compensation, and it's been also demonstrated economically that uh, considering the amount of money that goes into bank stabilization, particularly that's quite expensive, uh, it will be more beneficial to give that money back to the owners rather than uh, constantly uh, re-intervene in rivers. Thank you. Uh, Jason Duguay says, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Would you have any suggestions on managing built up sediment upstream of beaver dams or other man-made low head structures? So aggradation of sediments due to the yeah. presence. And managing the built up sediment, yeah. Well, assuming that that would create issues of flooding, I have to, yeah, we need to get more information on, on the specific situation there because is it that the accumulation of sediments is affecting the habitat or is it affecting public safety for example by uh, having a higher risk of floods so the the type of uh, answer would depend on whether we're looking at this from an angle of public safety or uh, habitat uh, restoration so i guess i since i know jason Duguay, <laughs> we can talk <laughs> about this <laughs> Uh, sorry, he just he just followed up with another uh, clarification when the low head dam is removed. So I guess maybe after taking out the low head. Uh, okay, so barrier, the sediments how, to handle the, how to handle the built up sediment. Yeah. Okay, so if I understand that would be that these sediments would migrate downstream uh, if this, there's a removal. Uh, uh, again, it, it, all these, it's always difficult to answer uh, any of these questions in a general way because there is always a local context to take into account and knowing what's downstream is, is obviously key um, so i guess I, I would say that I, my answer would be thoroughly analyze the local situation before making a decision there okay uh, bruce smith has a a comment and question i enjoyed the presentation very much we do have to be careful in generalizing i will point out the issue that the issue of beaver dams is not black and white especially in pei where they may not be a native species in our short spring fed streams dams can have long lasting impacts there is a big difference between one to two dams or 100 to two dam 100 to 200 dams on a short river as well our trout and salmon spawning in or near the headwaters where impacts of dams are greater we do have evidence of water temperatures reaching mid to high 20s and oxygen levels being greatly diminished in waters downstream from beaver dams. There are also huge impacts from the head of tide dams on, ac on access for Lanon salmon, its example, uh, smelts and Gaspro. When salmon populations are as low as they are in many PEI streams, the multitude of beaver dams can have a very notable negative impact. So it speaks to the importance of doing assessments on rivers uh, and as the speaker emphasized doing before doing any work. So it's a great comment. Yeah. No, it's a comment. It's, it's a, and it's a very valid comment. It, it, these are obviously, I'm reporting you know, what's in the literature. So it's impossible to, that all different cases uh, can be included there. But it, it's certainly important to remember that like the temperature issue in, in Wisconsin was uh, heavily used as an argument, but when you look back at the trace of um, where this, this came from, it all came from one single study, uh, which was cited and cited and cited over and over. Uh, so, so, but I'm convinced that there are local issues in, in Prince Edward Islands uh, that we should take into consideration, but it, it is still uh, essential with beaver dams to uh, to see that there are gray zones and it's not black and white because uh, the perception is often entirely negative uh, when they are depending on the scale you're looking at the problem possible positive outcomes but I, I totally agree with the comment sure just for clarification it came up as bruce smith but it was actually rosie mcfarland uh 
who's logged in under Bruce Smith that made that last comment. All right. Um, the next uh, question is in French, so just forgive me if my accent or my pronunciation is not quite <laughs> well, but I'll do my best. So this is from uh, Danielle La France. Est-ce que tu vois un tournant vers le, la restauration naturelle? En autre mot, est-ce que tu vois les groupes de restauration laisser les arbres dans les rivières comme une action de restauration? All right, so I guess I'll answer in English. Sure. And I can translate roughly that. Sure. Uh, so have I seen uh, in action, say, uh, areas and, or restoration projects that are letting um, more natural processes operate, and particularly with regards to wood? Uh, and my answer to that and is in Quebec, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not so far, although there's a lot more talks about this than there was five years ago, say, but certainly in uh, in other countries and in Europe, uh, a lot of projects. I was showing an example of the on the Iseron River near Lyon. And, and although the project is absolutely focused on flood management in that particular example, because it doesn't show in the slides that I had there that uh, this is a very, very dangerous river uh, because I was there at low flow when I took the picture, but the day, literally the day after, it was like a 25 year recurrence flood. And it, it's uh, a serious, uh, serious public safety issue in that context, even, but without having that as the priority for the project, they are still concerned uh, with adding wood and making sure that if they're intervening, it's beneficial for more than one objective. And that's the espace de bon fonctionnement concept in France, which we're trying to, to uh, promote heavily that it's, you should not always focus on a single objective when intervening in the river, you should try to, to look at the situation more broadly. But so we're, I'm quite hopeful that we're in that transition in Quebec and presumably in other provinces in Canada as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question is from Frank Johnson. Are there studies that support positive effects to increases in forest cover within a watershed? That supports increases and in, sorry, could you just repeat that? Are there, is there literature that uh, supports the, the benefits of having increased forest cover within a watershed? Oh, well, yeah, there are tons. I mean, like the ideal situation is, is a forest and watershed in terms of, water quality, habitat quality. So, so yes, I mean, uh, yeah, I haven't spoken about that specifically, but it goes without saying that, yeah, yes is the answer. Okay. Uh, Richard Van Ingen says, note uh, regarding the beaver dams blocking salmon migration, Mike Callahan from the Beaver Institute in the U.S. has been working on um, inserts that allow fish passage while leaving the dam intact. Um, he suggests looking up us, uh, I don't know if it's snow homish pond levelers. Uh, DFO, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Newfoundland, is planning a pilot project for this fall with a modified version. Interesting. It's very interesting to know when I. Um, there's another question uh, in French. Again, I'll, uh, I'll do my best here. Uh, bonjour, avec la drave qui fut effectuée pendant les uh, décennies? sur les milieux petits corps d'eau, un peu partout au Québec et en uh, Amérique du Nord, les gros débris lignus me semblent parfois être présents à des niveaux excès uh, grandement, <laughs> grandant, grandement uh, sur des corps d'eau naturels. De centaines voir les milieux de, um, is it B-I-L-L-O-T-S, Jean Pafroir, le, Les Cours d'Eau. I don't know if you can see the question. I think I didn't do a good job there at all. I, well, I'm trying, uh, okay, I'll do my best. I think the question, well, I mean, I, definitely the first part I understood in, in Quebec and in other provinces as well, uh, for many, many years, there was a lot of, um, and now I'm trying myself to translate drave, a drave, um, a I just, log, I just, sorry, um, just interrupt, sorry, I put it in your chat box uh, if you can read yeah, okay. there. Uh, but the, just the, 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 tra the transportation of wood using river systems, the, ter the term suddenly escapes my brain in English, uh, but that was very, very common in many rivers. A lot of tribes. Perhaps the 1980s. Uh, so, and that had a huge impact on rivers uh, and for not 
well, firstly, that there are many uh, wood debris or there's a lot of large wood that is still there coming from the, that period of time, but also it uh, affected the dimensions of rivers. Uh, oftentimes it widened rivers and now these rivers are adjusting, becoming narrower. It's been documented in the in Bassin Laurent and Gaspésie particularly. Uh, so, so yeah, that is a special case. These rivers that uh, have tons of debris inherited from uh, human interventions effectively, which was using rivers for the transportation of wood, uh, is not quite the same as what I was discussing. Uh, and But I would say the, the major impact of that is really about understanding that there's a, a trajectory of the rivers. They are now adjusting to a new dynamics where there's no more wood transport. Um, so any interventions in rivers like that should really take that into consideration, the morphological trajectory, uh, because of the adjustments following uh, the stop of the transportation of wood. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry for doing a, a poor job on that question. Um, Crystal asks, uh, thank you for the information. Very informative presentation. Do you know of any literature that supports uh, large woody debris additions versus in-stream structures in those areas where stream migration cannot be allowed? Um, for example, urban areas, or sorry, stream migration cannot be allowed, i.e. urban areas. Well, as I say, I, I totally uh, agree that there are areas where we cannot let the rivers freely uh, migrate, and urban areas is clearly a case. Um, but it doesn't prevent, like in terms of wood, I go back to my the France, the French example. Uh, it's still possible to have wood part of the solution, but controlling for uh, the migration at the same time. Uh, so it, it's finding that balance, but uh, it's very, very clear that concepts like freedom space for rivers concept uh, should are, are aimed at uh, targeting areas where there is that possibility, and oftentimes it's more in agricultural areas uh, than in urban areas where there are too many uh, public safety issues. Um, but it doesn't. Come, there's certainly a lot of European examples where wood still part of the solution in heavily urbanized areas uh, but that the migration of the channel itself is limited because there's no possibility there okay we've got two more questions here Lita O'Halloran says do you have any literature recommendations for when and how to implement adding LWD for restoration well the, yeah in the, in the, the, the references that I that are in the, the lit review there, there are many cases. Note that this um, lit review was produced in 2017 and I haven't updated it, uh, but it, it's, you look at, I follow the literature and in the last two years, I certainly have seen uh, a large number of papers, uh, again, coming a lot from Europe, but also North America. Uh, so yeah, that there, there are many cases and I could, uh, if, if people have questions, I guess the easiest thing would be to contact me directly. Um, sure. But yeah, it's it's a very it's an exponentially growing field. I would say. Great. And the final question is from Catherine Collette. As you noted, funding agencies have metrics such as number of dams removed or kilometers of stream cleaned. Do you have any alternate metrics that should be considered? Well, <laughs> it's the use of metrics that, what uh, from a hydrogeomorphological perspective, the best way of restoring, I'm sorry again to use the word restoration here, uh, it is, is a passive approach that to just let the processes do the job. Um, so that becomes really tricky in terms of metrics because you don't see this happening instantaneously. It takes some years and then it will the, the effect will be different whether or not you have a big flood in the short period of time or whether it takes uh, several years before you have a, a big flood. So. It's, it's probably important to convey the concept that uh, maybe we should you know, see things differently. Maybe it's the most valuable way of restoring is to compensate riparian owners or there are many ways of easements or purchase of lands or whatever to make sure that the processes can operate, that there's sufficient space. And I certainly know in Quebec uh, through various uh, programs in different ministries that that passive restoration approach is now considered a valid way uh, of, of 
certainly it's included in compensating for for other interventions in rivers so it, it, but it's tricky i admit to put in the list of uh, criteria and metrics but it, it's it's part of the thinking and the change of paradigm i think to devise these metrics thank you i think that it's fascinating that, yeah i've heard lots more talk about rewilding so it's a, it's along the same lines but that will be the difficulty is coming up with like you say changing the paradigm of the not tracking these other metrics it's going to be interesting to see how things change over the next few years Indeed. Uh, i want to thank you and i we've kept people longer than some people planned but that's great i'm glad we had so many great, great questions uh the next webinar will be on october 9th with rafael bouchard from the university de laval he will be speaking about um the effect of water temperature on the reproductive success of salmon after catch and release and this webinar will be in french delivered in french the next english webinar will be october 23rd from ben matthews of the nature conservancy will be speaking about designing road and stream crossings for fish passage and flood resilience so i want to thank you again to dr Berrin and to everyone who participated and we hope that you join us again soon